What's up, G1s, and welcome to episode 8 of the G1 Features Podcast. Yes, we already ate episodes, so, you know, double the amount of episodes that we have of the non-playable podcast, so it's at least going that, it at least has that achievement to, to it. As always, my name is Matt Hero, and with me today, of course, is uh, Gear. How are you doing, sir? I am looking at blurry pictures of Mike Wazowski. Oh my god, that probably means you're doing quite well. Yeah, probably. Oh, th- those blurry pictures of what Mike was asking, man. That, like, I'm not really sure what's so funny about them. Like, it's just sort of... They just kind of are. Like, right? Yeah. Like, it's so... Like, who comes up with that stuff? And all of a sudden, it's just... It's you know, just there. It's just there. Stuff happens, and it's wonderful. I don't know. Like, I wonder if Pixar ever looks at that and just goes... <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> I mean, they they have to know, right? Like, they're not stupid. They must know some. They must know something about it. Like at least like one intern may have informed John Lester. Hey, hey, look at this shit. Like, yeah, if memory serves, this blog is like very popular. Yeah, uh, 43,000 followers. Yeah, there's got to be some people from Pixar who follow that. Because, damn, son. They're just, uh, it, they're blurry pictures of Mike Wazowski are a gift to humanity that must be protected at all costs. Dude, that, those must be things that must go in the time capsule whenever, like, we do, like, whenever the apocalypse hits and we all die and our ancestors from 500 years later get the time capsule and see what ha- like what our culture has brought over these years and they see the blurry picture of Mike Wazowski they know we've done a good job or just think we're complete idiots One so or the both other. really yeah anyway speaking of um, Pixar therefore Disney for Lucasfilm. I saw Star Wars recently. I didn't. I saw it twice, actually, in one day. One in the morning and one in the evening. Damn, son. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, I got tickets like very early on when they were saying, okay, pre-orders are coming up for the tickets. I got the one for the evening screening because that's the one you really want to see for... You know, the other people going to experience it because most people are not going to be there for the morning screening because they have work and school and all that stuff. And I happen to be free at that time. But, uh, yeah, I went on the evening. Then I found out that I had nothing to do on that day. And a friend and a friend's other friend could not go. So I took the tickets, one of the <laughs> tickets. And therefore I saw it at 11 a.m. Wednesday, which is... Like, 36 hours earlier than most Americans will see it, which makes me quite smug. <laughs> the sad thing is that you already see a lot of people spoiling it. Like, uh, and not just, like, spoiling it accidentally, because, of course, this movie has been very sec- secretive about its plot and what it's about. But, uh, yeah, you see already a lot of dickheads spoiling it, if only... Oh, those guys. Yeah, if they want to boycott it or just, you know, be Ugh, trolls. White people. Oh, yeah, that thing. Yeah, that was... Uh, like, I remember on the Trevor Noah show where they were talking about a sinister multicultural agenda. And it was just the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. That is like the most white dudes you can get, you know? And I say this as a white dude. It's I'm white. like... Like, I'm white as shit as well, and to see this kind of... Calm the, the fuck top, down. Yeah, this kind of over-the-top reaction is just hilarious to me. But, um... Yeah, for the rest, it's really good, guys. Go watch it. It's actually really, really good, and by the time this comes up, most people will have probably seen it. I'm not gonna say anything regarding spoilers, because there's still people who have... Because there's still a lot of people who haven't. Myself included. Just know they they have done it. It's got it's back. Star Wars is back in this and it's probably best to go see it as early as possible to be part of that special moment because you do realize that after this there's gonna be like a Star Wars movie every year. 
and then there's no longer really that anything that's special about it. I mean, now, of course, the fact that it's so special is because it's been 10 years that we had the last one, Revenge of the Sith. It's been 32 years since we had the last one from these characters, such as Han Solo and... Uh, so, and you know, Luke. the last good one. That too, if you're in that camp. Most people with good taste in movies are in that camp. That's true. But, uh... So, yeah, that makes it all that spe- all the more special. So, you know, go watch it now before the old onslaught of when Rogue One comes out next year, when we get the Han Solo prequel, when we get a Boba Fett prequel, and all that, and of course Episode 8 and 9 and all that good stuff. Pretty much go see it as soon as possible before you get spoiled. It's really good, you guys. That's all I pretty much have to say about it without spoiling it because, you know, they've kept their guard up. And then for the rest, uh, yeah, like I finally moved on from Fallout 4, like, like, like after pretty much absorbing me for the last month or so. I finally put it down mostly, like just doing some stuff here and there, and moved on to a few other to a few new things. Uh, one of them is uh, Mario and Luigi Paper Jam or Paper Jam Brothers in uh, Europe, as we called it, which is out here. But I think it's still like I think it's February when it comes out in the U.S. I'm not sure. Wow, that's longer than I was anticipating. Either that or January. I'm not really sure right now. Either way, it still isn't out. Yeah. And like, I love the Mario and Luigi RPGs. Like, but I, it's weird because I only really like two of them. Like, Partners in Time I did not care for, and Dream Tea was also kind of eh, like it was alright. But I fucking love Superstar Saga and Bowser's Inside Story. I wasn't that big on Bowser's Inside Story, but I really liked it. I really liked Bowser. Talked about that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so so I've kind of been like I really love the gameplay, and you know they're more meant for kids in that sense, but they are, you know, so charming and so funny as well that I just really wanted to see. And this time they have uh, Paper Mario uh, brought along. Okay, it's January twenty second when it comes out in the U.S. So somewhere in between, but uh, yeah, I haven't played a whole lot of it now, but so far I'm digging it. It's Mario and Luigi, and if you've played those games, you kind of already know like uh, how it goes, but it's all in good fun. Like, where do you stand on the Mario and Luigi RPGs besides the fact that you're not the hugest fan of Bowser's Inside Story? I really like Superstar Saga. Um, and that's about it, really. You haven't played the other ones? No, I didn't. I skipped Partners in Time, and I didn't like the demo of Dream Team, so I didn't play that. I see. Uh, but, you know, if Paper Jam is as good as you say, I might give it a go sometime. It's so, not, it's it's not, so I'm not, like, right. I'm not, like, in a big hurry to play it. Eh, you're but not. It's like, you know, if I'm ever, like... If I'm ever, like, really bored, I might pick it up, or if it's, like, on sale or something. Yeah, though Nintendo doesn't really do a whole lot of sales. Like, you do see, sometimes they have, like, games like Link Between Worlds, which are $20 now, or 20 euros. Only in the eStore. Yeah, only in the eStore. But also, like, if you get the Nintendo Selects uh, version. I don't know what that means. Nintendo Selects is, like, pretty much the... Like, what used to be, like, the player selects, like, games that sold really, really well and are, like, okay, these are the ones that you need to get if you want to, like, these are the peop- the ones that people really like and buy a lot, like, that are have over a million copies sold or so, and Link Between Worlds is one of those, and oh, therefore they have a okay. budget version of it. Which cool. is like, And then for the rest, uh, I finally got started on Zelda Blade Chronicles X. Finally, after all these years of anticipation, mm-hmm. when it still had its simple title of X. And so far, yeah, really digging that as well. I'm not that, like, I've only played, like, a half hour of it, like, created my player character, 
who has the voice of Shulk, who has the voice of Shulk as it should be. <laughs> yeah, like there's like these six character options, and you can actually see like the names of the voice actor, and then you have your Yuri Lowenthal's and stuff like that. But then you have the classic and that then is uh, Adam Howden, who's the voice of Shulk, and it's pretty much the Shulk voice. And it's like, yep, done. That was a pretty easy selection to make. And then for us, like this game is massive. Like I, I actually got the like the down like there's these download uh, patches on the Wii U in order to make the game run faster. Oh, because that's just... not a good sign. No, they. Well, like there have been some critics of loading times, and they're not, not terrible, but they do make the game a whole lot faster if you download them. But they're like, I downloaded the whole thing. It's like 15 gigabytes. Jesus. Yeah, but uh, and the Wii U, of course, isn't like the, the max Wii U uh, is the uh, thirty-two gigs, so That's it takes a, quite a chunk of data. Kind of bad. It is pretty bad, but like, like the game is so massive that they couldn't fit it on a Blu-ray disc. So you know, think about that. Didn't that happen with something else as well? If you like, if you got the like the digital version of the Bayonetta double pack. Like Bayonetta one and two, if you got the digital version of that, it didn't actually fit on the console because it was more than thirty-two gigs. Uh, I do know what you're talking about. I don't think that was Bayonetta though. Oh no! no wait, was it? Um, was it? Was it the Fatal Frame? I feel like it was Fatal Frame. I feel like it was as well. Yeah, like something with Fatal Frame that caused it to be too much for the entire Wii U. Yeah. No, that was if you have an 8 gig Wii U, like, the game would not fit on your system. Wow, so if you have an 8 gig Wii U, then I guess you're stuck with crappy loading times on Xenoblade Chronicles X. Or something like that. Like, I don't know, like, I'm down, apparently if you get the digital version, though, why would you? Because then your whole system is full. Unless you get, like, an external hard drive, which I probably should at some point. Because the Wii U does support external hard drives. Okay, yeah, I've like, you know, I've had my PS4 full enough to be like not fit anything anymore. But that's when I had literally not uninstalled anything. Yeah. And the PS4, at least my PS4, is 500 gigabytes. Yeah, that's the standard now. Like an X, you can get an Xbox One uh, terabyte console now for 350 bucks. I think I think the PS4 sells. Terabyte, one terabyte version. They as do well, as well, no, yeah. But uh, yeah, like, like in the digital age, it's kind of inexcusable to how low the Wii U in terms of. Like, yeah, I've spaces. seen freaking like flash drives with more storage. I've seen SD cards with more storage space than the Wii U. Yeah, it's pretty shit, but you know, whatever. And the, and if, and for the rest, uh, yeah, that's about it in terms of what I've played. Played anything cool or? No, I got back to uh, Dragon Quest Heroes. How far are you with that? I'm almost done. I okay. know that for a fact now. Like, there's like some character specific missions that unlock right before the end, but oh. I can basically go do the last level anytime I want now. Uh, okay, so you're pretty much done with it because you left it behind for a while because because then i got into uncharted and then i got into just cause and so it sort of fell behind but i i got sort of sick of just cause 3 because it sort of crashed behind a loading screen oh that always sucks and i was just like you know what i'm gonna play something else for a while and uh, so i got back into dragon quest heroes 3 yeah not much new to report there it's just still fun yeah. Still really enjoying it. But you're kind of done with Just Cause 3 or just... Well, I'm not done with it because I haven't, like, finished it. But I just, I got really fed up with the technical issues. But apparently a new patch just came out, so that might fix some things. Okay, so hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Like, I still haven't played Just Cause 3, and I'm... Like, I'm not sure if I should get it at some point, but... If you can, get the PC version. <laughs> My PC cannot handle Just Cause 3. Yeah. But I've heard that the console version is definitely the one that... Uh, I mean, the PS4 version might become... Pl 
playable later, but right now it's uh, like if you can get a drop or something, then it's probably okay. Like like in its current state, don't get it for full price, or just wait till it fit. It's fixed, and honestly, by the time it's fixed, it'll probably have gotten a price drop anyway. So yeah. The sad thing is, is that the Xbox One version is apparently even worse. So oh, yeah. If you got that version, you're truly fucked. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, besides that, uh, let's see uh, what happened in the gaming space in terms of news that we can talk about. Kojima got released from the Konami dungeon. He is free! Like, after all the drama, after all the shit that went down with Konami and Kojima... After Metal Gear Solid V, despite being still really, really good, being obviously unfinished, like obviously at some point something happens where he could not finish the work. Uh, let's see. After all the shit that got thrown at Konami, after not being allowed to go and accept an award, he's finally free. He's finally his contract is finally up. He's allowed to go wherever he. He can go, and of course, that, like, almost obviously, that turned out to be Sony. It made sense. It made a heck of a lot of sense, like, especially with how, like, Kojima is also so synonymous with PlayStation in the sense of how he created Metal Gear Solid, and how Metal Gear Solid is one of the all-time great PS1 games, mm-hmm. and pretty much one of the most important games ever released. And then, you know, you just, uh, like, with it just made sense for him to, like, that seemed like the most logical spot for him to go when that was all said and done. And now you sort of have to see, okay, what's his next project? Because he's made a new independent studio, so he's only really helping in the resource front and having console exclusivity. It's all, like, whatever he's making next is also coming to PC. But But it's not coming to Xbox. It's not coming to Xbox. It's not coming to Nintendo consoles. But basically, yeah, whatever he's cooking up next, it's probably going to be a while because, you know, it take, that takes a bit, game development. Yeah, you know, he still has to start it. Yeah. Like, and we can hire like, people. Like, there's already a bit of a startup with Kojima Productions, but not enough to really... Uh, like you, with Kojima, you can always expect he has these grand visions for his games with what he wants to do, and I'm kind of curious what he does now on an independent scene. Because he's like one of the very few people you can call an auteur in this industry. Absolutely. And, he, and that just makes you curious, okay, what does he do next? And that's, inc- and that's very exciting. I mean, I'm not sure where you stand on it with Kojima. You have not... You've played Metal Gear Solid 3, I know that. Yeah, and a bit of Ground Zeroes. Yeah, that's but... about it. Yeah. But still, you really like Metal Gear Solid 3, right? Oh, yeah. It's so then, a phenomenal game. So then, of course, it's all... I think we're all very excited with what he does next, especially when he's now free from the shackles. Oh, yeah. I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see where he's going to go. And of course, now we can all stop giving a shit about Konami. Yeah, unless you're really into Yu-Gi-Oh! video games. <laughs> I do wonder, like... Because obviously a lot of people are targeting them for the pachinko machines and all, and the slot machines and pretty much all the gambling stuff. I do kind of wonder how much money Yu-Gi-Oh! makes for them, because they own that franchise. Like, all their, their name is on the cards. Like, in the... On like the bottom right corner, so you kind of have to wonder, like, okay, how much of a money maker is that? I imagine that's kind of died down nowadays. Like, like Magic: The Gathering really saw a resurgence recently. Yeah, the last couple of years, and that's now like the big dominant trading card game. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I see, I still see Yu-Gi-Oh cards in the shops and stuff, and they still have tournaments. So I imagine there's a movie it's coming uh, next year. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's still that's still a thing. I do wonder how much that... But, you know, you already see... Like, they're hiring for the new Metal Gear game, which just seems like a bad idea. Like, every... Like, with most people, you could probably get away with... Like, with most franchises, you could maybe get away with it. 
But with a franchise that is so intrinsically tied to its creator, that's just going to come up like... No one is gonna buy Metal Gear Solid Six without Kojima's involvement. It's or at least, basically like, gonna be like season four of Community, pretty where, much. Like, they try to do the thing that made it good, but without the original person there to actually make it good, it just comes off as a cheap imitation. Yeah, similarly, uh, there was uh, season four of the Boondocks, which is, did not have its creator attached to it, and it was terrible. And that's unfortunately the way it ended. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but the first three seasons are great. So then, you know, but then, uh, but yeah, this is like, I cannot see it go well. Like, I think every Metal Gear fan out there is not blind enough to support a new Metal Gear game without Kojima evolved. And the stat, but the sad thing is that's probably their biggest franchise besides Pro Evo. And... You know, I, th- I thought they said they were done with console development. Or at least AAA development. So they had. There've been mixed reports on whether they are, but chances are they are. But most likely, yeah, they're not gonna do anything anymore. So and I'm the, curious what this new Metal Gear game is gonna be. I'm very curious as well. Like but, a mobile game. <laughs> I honestly just want to want someone to buy Konami, or at least their IP. There's so much good IP there that can oh be. Oh my god! Could you imagine? If they made, like, a Metal Gear Solid version of Final Fantasy All the Bravest, oh, yeah. people would see. riot. I could see that happening. Let's see what else. Uh, well, we already saw the the Castlevania Pachinko, the erotic violence. Uh, the Silent Hill uh, slot machine. We saw that as well. Hit the lever! <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we kind of just, like, someone... Please buy their IP. I want a new good Castlevania, and I know Bloodstained is coming, but still. Like, I love Castlevania. Don't let it rot. Don't let Lords of Shadow 2 be the last thing we see of that game that isn't a pachinko machine. I'm sure Nintendo wouldn't mind having Castlevania. Oh no, they would like that. But also, like, you know, Metal Gear. They give that to Sony... Give Bomberman a home, maybe. Contra, like, give that to Way Forward or something like that. They did a good job with Contra 4. Just, please, please give them to someone else if you're not going to do anything with it. Because, come on. Like, that just feels like such a waste of, uh, of these great uh, properties. Like, even Capcom with you know, we give Capcom a lot of shit for how they treat some of their IP. But at least they're using it. Except like at least Mega Man. Well, yeah, but they at least gave Mega Man a platform on Smash Brothers, and they at least like made the Mega Man Legacy Collection. Yeah, they're not working on a new game, as far as we know. But they're, at least they're doing shit with it. Like, they know, like, okay, there are enough fans out there that care, that want us to do stuff with him. Like, Capcom actively use it. Like, hell, they still even use characters from Darkstalkers from stuff like, for stuff like Marvel vs. Capcom and, and that shit. But, no, you don't see anything in terms of uh, what Konami is doing besides, you know, slot machines. So, yeah. Konami. Uncertain future, but honestly, fuck them. Yeah. And Kojima, best of luck all the way. Definitely. And then, of course, let's see what... Oh, uh, uh, yeah, that was the last ever Smash Direct. I'm not sure if this is the last ever news we'll get from Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS, but it did have a big feeling of it being the end of it all. <clears throat> and, you know, if this is the end of it, and it seems like it is, it's been one hell of a ride, and they ended on one heck of a final... Uh, like, they ended it great. Definitely. Yeah. I well, mean, we... Oh, yeah, you go ahead, sorry. We, we could do without, you know, another Fire Emblem character. Yeah, we've already that's got how it started. five of them, but... Six, actually. Well, six including this one, right? Yeah. This is the... Like, yeah, they, they first started with the announcement of Corin being a new character in uh, 
in the Smash Bros. And Corrin is the main character in Fire Emblem Fates, which is the new one, which is coming in February. But it's already out in Japan for a while, so they obviously have more of an attachment towards it. But as someone who does not, it was just kind of like, okay. I mean, it does seem like a cool character to use, but at the same time, it's just kind of like, there's already like so many Fire Emblem characters, and I don't know this one, so I don't really care. Like, at least with Awakening, that was such a new one. But still, sort of like, okay, I know these characters a, a bit more. So that there was some attachment to it. And, and of course, there are the old ones of uh, Marth, Roy, and Ike. But now it's just kind of like, uh, I don't care. Like, I don't know where you stand on it, but... Uh, I mean, I've, I've already made clear of how I, what I stand on it. It's just, it's just kind of really lame. Yeah. It's just lame in the sense that I don't know him, and again, there's so many other characters you could have used, but then that's just being greedy with just how many Nintendo characters they could have, they can use for this thing. Like, goddamn. But uh, the second character announcement was a lot more interesting in that it was Bayonetta. Yeah, Bayonetta. That like I chose Bayonetta for the Smash Bowl. Like, I tried to go realistic with my choice, and I felt like. Okay, Bayonetta. She has. They have a partnership with Platinum Games, and uh, like they published the the second one, obviously, which kept the franchise alive. And I'm genuinely ultimately, surprised that no one else went for it. Uh, a lot of well, a lot of people did in the sense that she was the number one character in Europe. I mean, like no, nobody went for um, Bayonetta two. Like no, no, nobody else wanted to publish it. No, that was really surprising, especially like Bayonetta was semi-successful i believe like i believe it sold like a million copies but apparently that wasn't enough for someone like sega or any other uh publisher to stand up and make it so of course the nintendo did and bayonetta 2 is fucking awesome so i'm told but uh yeah what like i chose bayonetta mostly because it seemed realistic like as because i know a lot of people were going for shovel knight and I thought... Like, I can kind of see that, but... Shovel Knight is such a good fit for the franchise, but at the same time, I'm just kind of like, mm, no, no. Nah. I just want to go for something a little more realistic than that. Even if Bayonetta seems unrealistic in the sense that she's obviously a very mature character, a very sexualized character, and how yeah. something like that fits in Smash Bros. is, you know, kind of funny. I mean, we had Snake... So it's not, like, a new thing. It's not a new thing to have characters from a mature franchise enter Smash Brothers, but still, there is that, like, Bayonetta is super sexualized. But, uh, who cares? She's in it, and it's, and she looks awesome to use. And that's really, like, she's co apparently going to come out in February or so. So, so it's still going to be a few months of waiting. But it's really awesome that she is the last character to be uh, in there. Definitely, and I like. Um, I mean, I, I'm sort of annoyed that they're releasing all these new characters as DLC, but I do have to give Nintendo some degree of credit for having so much post-launch support for this game. They had, uh, like Sakurai stated, like pretty much at the end of the video, like these characters were pretty much all created from scratch. Like they did not they did not start working on a DLC until the game is finished. And, you know, like, Smash Bros. came out in November 2015, and since then, they've been really continuing to working on this game, like, the costumes, the... I'm assuming you mean 2014. Yeah, I said 2014. No, you did not. Oh, sorry. You said no, 2015. This... No, this game did not come out a month ago. Yeah, it was just like, I've had it longer than that. But especially when you see, like, the... You know, those games like Evolve that went that announced itself through DLC, pretty much. Yeah, that's really shameless. Yeah, it's nice to have, you know, just the pace and the, you know, continuing to work on this game in a way that, uh, you know, gets its lifespan going, pretty much. Like, Fallout 4 as well is sort of, you know, they have now, there is a season pass for it, and there is going to be DLC. But as far as we know, like, they've only just started working on the DLC. 
They haven't immediately announced it. They just said, like, okay, here's a season pass that is that is there as well. But with, uh, yeah, Smash Brothers, they've done it really, really well. And yeah, of course, you know, you can be greedy and say, I would have preferred if this was free. But at the same time, you do want some of the work that they do on these get to pay off. Like, for example, Splatoon does everything for free, and that's pretty crazy. Like, Splatoon has had no DLC yet. Just no paid continu- DLC. No paid DLC. Just continuous updates over and over. But, uh, yeah, definitely going to get those characters. Even Corrin, if only to, you know, got to have them all. And then, of course, Cloud, which I got af- almost, like, the day after that he was released because, of course, after a Smash Brothers character is announced, like, oh, he's available right now, the whole eShop crashes and no one is able to get him. Nintendo still doesn't exactly understand how the internet works. Well, they understand how it works more and more. It's just kind of like they can only stress test so much until, you know, their ser- the whole thing crashes. Because thousands of people watch it, and all of a sudden, everyone tries to come in online. But, uh, yeah, anyway, besides that, uh, yeah, let's see what uh, what else is going on in the world. Not a whole lot, actually. Like, we can just... talk about that stupid GameFAQs thing. Oh, we can talk about that. Also, Napster is coming to the Wii U. Yeah. Yeah, that's a thing. Like, welcome back to the 90s. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, like you mentioned uh, the game facts thing, as you've probably already heard by now with uh, all the salt that's been spreading on the internet on the social delicious, media. Delicious salt. Is that uh, recently there was a game facts poll, and game facts does these polls like every five years or so, as far as I know, where they pretty much have this whole bracket of games to uh, combat one another to see what is the best game. Uh, like, ever, pretty much. And then they see... It's, it's literally called best.game.ever. So that doesn't leave much to the imagination. But, like, I think they do this, like, every five years or so. Like, every year. Like, on 2005, 2010, 2015, and then in 2020, they'll probably do another one. But, uh... Basically, what happened is that... You usually expect your Final Fantasy VII, your Ocarina of Times, your Pokemons, your Super Mario Worlds to sort of just take the poll and leave it at that. But the little game that could, the game that came out three months ago, went and took the crown. Undertale yes. won the poll and is now GameFAQ's official best game of all time. Yeah. Which got a lot of people very angry, which made me very happy it's all just kind of hilarious to see like how people take it seriously like and, uh, seriously to an insane degree like sort of like guys it's just it's just a poll that doesn't that ultimately does not matter calm down yeah but, uh, like i'm let's see like what routes did it have to take to get this far i have the poll right here like it started against mass effect 3 and beat that okay i agree with I'm not even sure what Mass Effect 3 is doing on there. Hmm. Uh, then it beat Fallout 3, which I wholly disagree with. Then it went on to beat Super Mario World, which I also disagree with. Then, in its final round of its division, it beat Pokemon Red and Blue. Rightfully so. I'd still disagree, but that's because I'm extraordinarily nostalgic for Pokemon Red and Blue. And while, Bo- uh, while Undertale is the better game, like, no one can deny the impact that Red and Blue had. But, you know, I'm more of a gold and silver guy. And ultimately, I'll accept his defeat because, you know what? This does not matter. It then, really doesn't matter. No, honestly. then in its uh, quarterfinal round, like, when all the games got together, it beat Super Mario 64. Rightfully so. No! I also disagree with that. Super Mario 64 is not a good game anymore. It still is. No, it is not. Yes, it is. It's like saying GoldenEye is still a good game. 
it has some good moments, but no, Super Mario 64 played it. Like I still played it. It still holds up. I, I stick by that. It controls like ass. No, it doesn't. It actually it's controls. It's floaty. It's awkward. It's like, it feels like you're moving through jello. I completely disagree. But whatever. What a. It beats Smash Brothers Melee, which, of course, got the salty te- tears rolling once again. And I'm of the opinion that Melee is sort of overrated, but, you know. I prefer Brawl, personally. Ooh. I prefer the Wii U version. Like I mean, Wii. yeah, I, I'm enjoying the uh, the three the three DS version the best, but like I prefer Brawl over Melee still. Yeah, same here in the sense that I prefer something much, much more casual than you know the the sweaty tryhard version. Yeah, but you know Melee does have a lot of again a lot of nostalgia for me as someone who played like that was the multiplayer game to have. And then it ultimately, in the final, it managed to beat uh, Ocarina of Time to become GameFAQ's best game ever. The Let me game... tell you something that happened mm-hmm. uh, in this poll. Or rather, that happened today regarding this poll. Uh-huh. Because GameFAQ also does a poll of the day. Okay. And today's poll of the day was, did the best game ever contest convince you to buy Undertale? Um... Fun fact, 6,112 people, that's 24.86% of the total respondents, uh, responded, no, and I refuse to ever buy it purely out of spite. Hmm. And 74% was yes, then, or? Well, there were four other options. Oh, okay. I might have, but I already owned it before the contest started as 21.48%. Yes, I picked it up after it was featured in the contest battles is 3.91%. Okay, so but then again, there's like 128 games on that poll, so then... Yeah. You but, know, and the others are somewhat, I might have to try out the demo now, and not really, it's not my style of game, not something I'd ever get. Which had the most number of respondents at 29.64%. Eh, you know, fair enough. Sort of like, okay. Yeah. But I love that I refuse to buy it purely out of spite is even a category. Yeah. And that a quarter of the people that responded to the poll picked that. It's been pretty crazy, sort of like, uh, just how it all has, how it has all gone down. Like, you don't expect, like, even with all the, you know, the talk of the salt, like, you can't expect, like, you, you'd expect something of a retaliation that, okay, it's not going to be the Ocarina of Time. Oh, it's not going to be Melee. But no, it just kept going. It's pretty crazy that it's now, you know, part of this big pulp, that it's, that it did so. And if it matters, you know, it doesn't. But I mean, it really doesn't matter. Like, it matters less than the Game Awards. And that says something, because the Game Awards also don't matter. You can always go in and just sort of, like, talk about, okay, do how much of these things... Uh, but it's just a poll, and you know, it's it's cool that it did so, but you know, it's in the end it won, and that's that. And now it's just kind of like seeing all the salt flow of the people who take it, who do take it seriously. Like that's just the, that's just been the greatest gift. I mean, let's be honest though, GameFAQs is well known for having a pretty shitty community, so. Oh, yeah. I can't say I wasn't expecting some kind of backlash against this. Like, like I've seen people go straight up conspiracy mode, you know? Yeah. It's just like, it's part of the evil SJW agenda to make people vote for liberal parties and destroy Western culture. You know, I'm paraphrasing that, but I'm pretty close. <laughs> That's, uh... Jesus. But I've seen, like, a whole bunch... Like, I've seen, like, the Pokemon Reddit lost its mind when the... When Red and Blue lost to Undertale. And, you know, the Pokemon Reddit, like, you know, when you say Reddit, you immediately, like, you already kind of know what to expect, but they're usually pretty cool people. And it's just kind of like, uh, come on, people, just relax. It all, it, like, we can't say enough, like, how little it matters. And maybe that's a bit contradictory to the fact that we're talking about it. But, you know, it it's a great game. Let's it's not the best game ever, not by a long shot. But then, what is the best game ever? Because that is so completely subjective. 
Like, there is no objective best game ever. Just like Citizen Kane is indeed objectively the best movie. That is ultimately your opinion. I don't know. That's just how I personally feel about it. Yeah, and that's like... And that's really the only reason we're talking about this is that gaming news has sort of slowed down recently. Yeah, it's all just... Like, everyone is, like... There's still some news here and there of stuff that is going on. But, you know, all the big games are out now. Like, there's nothing new coming out until January, and even then, that is... Jesus, I have to get the list to see. Like, what's the biggest game coming out in January? And even... That's probably not something major. Let me quickly get the list. To Wikipedia I go. Then, uh... Like, Paper Jam is coming out in January, and then, like, oh, wow, there's really, there's a lot of 3DS stuff coming in, uh, in, uh, January. Like, Hyrule Warriors Legends, Final Fantasy Explorers, and then Paper Jam. But, like, probably the biggest game right now that I see is The Witness. Like the Jonathan Blow. Uh, oh, is that finally coming out? Yeah, that's apparently uh, locked for a uh, twenty-sixth January twenty-sixth uh, release date. But that's it. So right now, everyone's just sort of slowing down, and we're ultimate and ultimately going to focus on okay, what's the mo- what's the game of the year? What's the most anticipated game of uh, next year that will ultimately be delayed to twenty seventeen? Because of course. So, of course, let's, you know, tag along. Let's talk about 2015, especially with the games that define 2050, the games that define 2015 uh, coming out uh, on G1 features at some point. But let's focus on, you know, the regular old game of the year. So, Gare, what is your game of the year 2015? Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. Really? Yeah. Okay, and why is it your game of the year? It's probably the game that really captivated me most this year. And that's not to say that um, Undertale didn't, because Undertale is right up there as well. But I haven't played most of Undertale. I think I'm about halfway through. And I've played, and I admittedly haven't finished Monster Hunter 4 either, but... Is there a way to finish Monster Hunter 4, or, uh... Well, I haven't even done all the story missions yet, so... There's a story? <laughs> yeah, there's okay. more of a story than there was in Monster Hunter 3. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, Monster Hunter 4, it really captivated me in... And I've mentioned this on the podcast before, but it has been a couple of episodes now. That just... It's kind of like my Dark Souls, you know? It's like... It's a game that is definitely not for everyone... But there's just a such such a great feeling of satisfaction of like preparing your gear, um, choosing the right combinations of food to get you the right buffs that you need, um, you know, sort of stalking your prey from afar, and then while you're in combat with it, um, using all the tricks you know, using the right combos, maybe using items that you that you need. And just seeing a plan come together well and conquer a massive beast and sell it for parts or, better yet, use its, uh, use its parts to make new, better, and cooler armor. Just mm-hmm. of overcoming that huge challenge is something that's just so inherently satisfying. And as I think that something Monster Hunter 4 is something that, I could, that does it really well and something that I definitely appreciated. Yeah. I get, like, Monster Hunter 4, or just Monster Hunter in general, is something that just never clicked with me. So, I, like, I'm just hearing these things and just kind of like, okay, sure. And, like, it's really good that these things apply to you personally, that because it has found its fan base more and more. Like, you see Monster Hunter becoming more and more of a big deal in the West. Like, Thankfully. It's just, yeah, and it's great. But it's just something like, oh my god, like, I want to like this franchise, but I just can't. I mean, I'm like that with the Souls games, you know? I, I I tried playing Dark Souls, and I just can't get into it. I can definitely appreciate what makes it good, and I I can definitely understand other people's opinions on Dark Souls. Like, you know, Super Bunny Hop and stuff. He has a really good video about Dark Souls. 
Um, but like, I just, I personally can't get into it. I'm really bad at Bloodborne. I can't get into that either. Yeah. But Monster Hunter, Monster Hunter is my jam. Yes. So then, uh, my game of the year. I played a lot of good games this year. Like, 2015 has been a pretty kick-ass year in terms of, you know, pretty cool games uh, that have come out. Like, be it Splatoon. Like, that's a really good Wii U game. Uh, let's see. There's, uh, um, um, why am I blanking all of a sudden? Witcher 3. <laughs> yeah, Witcher 3 is such a great game. Like, that is... Like, Witcher 3 is probably one of the best ever games I have played in terms of shared design. Like, just how varied it all is, how huge it is, how pretty it looks, how... Like, just the detail of it. Like, see, like, major fucking props to CD Projekt Red. But I have to go, like, it is, you know, when looking at it from a design perspective, and especially, like, from a story... Like, it's one of the best games I've ever played, but... Like, I have to go with my heart, and it's not my game of the year, personally. Like, Metal Gear Solid V is also incredible, but as I've mentioned, I find it very unfinished, and therefore, you know, there's a lot of things that it just doesn't really feel right with me. Undertale is is absolutely brilliant, but ultimately, it has to be about the... Like, I feel my game of the year has to be the game that I can shut up about... And maybe it's only because I haven't played enough Xenoblade Chronicles X because it came out late. But Fallout 4, man. Fallout 4 is just... Like, as much of the complaints that I've had, it just... It's like a succubus. It sucks the life out of you. Except not through your dick. No, not through my dick. Through my controller, pretty much. Like, it just... Like, Ken Levine put it best in that Fallout 4 is not a game. It's a like, I'm blanking on the exact quote all of a sudden, but pretty much he called it like a life simulator. Like, it's a game that just absorbs you and takes over your entire life. It's those games with the water cooler moments. Like, oh, I did this thing, or I came across this thing, and now and suddenly I was on a boat with a bunch of... Uh... Yeah, I can't really say because it's, it's too good a thing to uh, really spoil for those that haven't played the game yet and even if the story isn't that great and even if it resorts too often to violence and has a myriad of technical issues well that's that just comes with Bethesda games so then you can like it's the game that just kept me going and going and yeah that's definitely without a doubt my game of the year okay like, even if like it's so flawed, but it's so good as well. It's so absorbing. And just, man, I love that game. Like, props to Bethesda for making such a good game. And, you know, I accept all the flaws that it has. But, yeah, that is, uh... Yeah, Fallout Force, my game of the year by quite a stretch. Like, no game is absorb me in some time that's very interesting i mean i i haven't played it because i've already explained my reasons why but um yeah it's it's interesting how like different our picks are like i have yeah. a, a a very niche sort of well it is kind of monster hunter honestly is kind of niche you know it's, it is super it's niche in the west yeah like if you go to japan it's everywhere but yeah, it's definitely niche here, and but I love it. And you have like probably the one of the, if not the most anticipated game of this year. Like it's probably yeah, it was probably the I couldn't have chosen like a bigger game in terms of both hype and it was that or MGS five. Yeah, like that. Like that's those, right up there too. Yeah, those two. Uh, like they are very triple A picks. And the, like it does say a lot about Fallout when it can mostly actually live up to its high expectations, you know, like technical issues and all, shoddy story and all. Like the fact that it's managed to captivate not only you but so many other people, I imagine it'll be pretty high up on other people's top ten lists as well. You know, it's probably gonna be in a lot of top ten lists. Like 
I'm curious how like there's gonna be a game of the year edition with all the DLC attached to it at some point. But I'm kind of curious because I was surprised when, uh, like, I think all of the game of the year awards is gonna be a three way tie to uh, Metal Gear Solid Five, Fallout Four, Witcher Three, and maybe Bloodborne. But Bloodborne seems to have a case of coming out early, where people sort of not think about it as much in terms of the game of the year category. Well, I mean, it's it's DLC. Uh, the Old Hunters came out recently, That's so that true. probably put it back in the back on the radar. That's true, but there's a lot of people that uh, you see. There's a lot in Oscar, uh, like during the movie award season, where the movies that come out early usually are the ones that mostly get forgotten about at some point. And then, and there are exceptions to this, but usually, and that's. Uh, and this is also something that has kind of happened with the uh, games. Like, I think Bioshock Infinite also had this problem when it came out in March. Bioshock Infinite was all over the top ten lists that year, dude. Yeah, maybe, but... Dude, it was on my top ten list. It probably was on mine as well, but... Uh, you... What I'm trying to say is that sometimes early, like things that come out early tend to get forgotten at the end of the year. But... Anyway, like I, I do uh, like I think Bloodborne is. It's also maybe a little too niche of a title, perhaps. I think it's the most. Um, I think it's the most approachable of all the from software games. Yeah, def- that definitely. But it's still a from software game. Yeah, and it sold like a million copies. And I was one of them. Yeah, I have it as well. So you know, I'm garbage at it, but. I am too. It is hard as balls. That's what people like about it. So, you know, I can't really judge. Yeah, although I think, honestly, that that Undertale will probably see a lot of um, Oh yeah, Undertale will probably... As well. Her Story, I think, as well. I remember people loving that game. Yeah, Her Story kind of... Like, that got a surge at the Game Awards where it won uh, the best performance and also something else that I forgot... I can maybe see read-only memories, although that one's pretty mm-hmm. small. That's probably too small, yeah. Like, under, like if there's going to be an indie game, it's going to be Undertale that people are going to talk the shit out of. I really want to play read-only memories. I really want to play it as well. It looks in- like I've only heard about it recently, but it re- looks really cool. And I, I, all- I heard about it when it came out, and then I sort of lost track of it. And then, like you, because of the extra credits episode, I was reminded of it. Yeah, and I always love me some cyberpunk, and it looks very cyberpunky, and adventure style. So I'm just kind of like, yes, give give me, because Cyberpunk 2077 isn't going to be out for a while. So then, might as well something. Uh... You could also play Shadowrun. Yeah, Shadowrun's always good. I didn't play that uh, a lot, but I do quite like that game. Yes. All right, then. I think that's a, like that's our game. Do you have a worst game of the year, personally, or don't? Or don't really... Uh, I mean, I didn't really play that many bad games this year. I think by just, default... Uh, it let's would, say most disappointing. Instead. I think by default that would have to be Just Cause 3. Okay. And I mean, Just Cause 3 is not a bad game. It's just sort of like disappointingly not good. Yeah. Yeah, let's stick with Disappointed, because I can't say that I've played too many bad games either. And I gotta say, probably my most disappointing game was probably... I guess Arkham Knight? That's like what something I was expecting, about, yeah. Yeah. It, like, Arkham Knight's fine. Like, it does a lot of stuff right. But there's also something, like, there's something very by-the-numbers of it, and there's just... Like, there's the stuff with the Batmobile... There's the fact that you can't get the true ending until you have to get all the Riddler trophies, and that is complete bullshit. That should be an optional thing. Yeah. And just... The disastrous I, PC launch, although that yeah. didn't affect you, but it affect still... Like, besides, the fa- besides the one point that I uh, fell through the scenery, like, Arkham Knight ran fine for me pers- like personally. But, uh, yeah, like, it's kind of by the numbers it was kind of like something i bought on a whim like i didn't really have the hype for that so many other people had but you know it just 
it could have been a lot better. And like, and I'm curious, like, what Rock said he's gonna do next because this does definitely feel like the end of the Arkham franchise. But of course, with Batman, you know, you want to keep that shit going. It's never truly over for Batman. No, absolutely not. They'll probably but, reboot it in a couple of years and just make a different Batman game. Well, yeah, then one not called Arkham, but you can... Like, there were these rumors that they were making a Superman game at one point. That would be weird. That would be weird, yeah. But uh, we'll see, because they have created an interesting alternative DC universe. Or rather, just Batman. But... We shall see. I think it's time we went for uh, questions. Yeah, let's just... Uh, or rather, the Stickman question hour, because he's the only one that sends in questions. Well, it's not true. We did have one other person. Yeah, true. But like still. two it's... episodes ago. <laughs> yeah. People, we really appreciate it if you get, if you get some questions. But for now, let's... Uh... What's Stickman's question? What's the film you've been the most excited for? I'm assuming that's like of all time because it didn't specify this year. So I'm going to go for all, of all time. Uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Really? Yeah. Most that this been of all time? Yeah. Okay. Well, I know like you were a fan of the books, right? Um, yeah, I read, I read the first volume before the movie came out, and then I got the others later. Um... Mostly just because you showed me the trailer. Uh-huh. And I was like, I need to see this movie. And then it didn't come out where I lived. <laughs> oh, yeah, that happened. Yeah, because yeah. I lived in Indonesia at the time, where they're, uh, my theory is, at least, uh, I know for a fact they're not really cool with homosexuality over there. And so my theory is that it didn't come to theaters because Wallace. Um... And so I had to wait until I could get, like, a bootleg copy on DVD, uh, because that's the only way to get DVDs in that friggin' country. Um, and then that one turned out to be corrupted, so every time it got to a particular point in the movie, it would just crash. Uh. And so there was just, like, so much buildup for this friggin' movie, and, I, and it, you know, it was worth it. Like, I love that movie, still to this day. Yeah. But it's just like, man... I, I, I am still a little bit annoyed that it didn't come to theaters because I absolutely 100% would have gone to see it. Yeah, that is disappointing that something like that happens. Because I, I, like, I would love to see that movie on the big screen. Like, wow. But it is, It's a visual treat. I haven't seen it in a while, but I should probably get to that at some point. Yeah. But yeah, for me, definitely. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. Oh, man. I gotta think. What was mine most anticipated? Probably, if I look at it from, like, back in the day, like, Pokemon the first movie, probably. But that's, like, when I was six to seven years old, and I absolutely was, like, everything revolved around Pokemon. And just, I had to see that movie in the theater. But that's just, you know, childish excitement in that sense. When did that movie come out? It was, like, 1999. Okay, so I was still in Europe at the time. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that. At least I think it was nineteen ninety nine, but to me. Yeah, because the sequel was Pokemon two thousand. Yeah. Let so me... it would be like late nineties. Like Pokemon, the first movie with Pro, and then let's. I'm gonna quickly check if it's really uh, nineteen ninety nine. Um. Yeah, yeah, nineteen ninety nine. Though nineteen ninety eight in Europe. But uh, anyway, yeah, that's probably it. And then probably like as an adult, as someone who's more into movies now these days, it's probably the Avengers. Like oh, the that's event, a good one. Yeah, like just sort of the culmination of all those universes coming together. I'm like, this hadn't been done before. It seemed so crazy. Like I remember reading an article from like back in the day how there will never be an Avengers movie. And then here we are in 2012 with two of them. Yeah, like now. I was in yeah in now, and I was in Mexico at the time when the movie yeah uh, premiered finally, and I saw it like in a super crowded theater, and it was one of the best cinema experiences of my life. And then it just turned out to be so worth like just 
you know, the excitement of seeing this crazy plan actually coming together and sticking the landing. It just seemed impossible, but they did it. And we can also, you know, just spin off this question to what's coming out next year, like 2016. Got anything uh, looking forward there? or? Uh... I don't exactly have the list in front of me, but what I'm immediately thinking of is No Man's Sky. Uh, I mean movies. But, oh, uh... um... Uh... I, honestly, I don't really pay attention to movies all that much, so the nice guys, I guess. Oh, the Shane Black movie. Yeah. That looks like a lot of fun. That like After the trailer, that immediately shot to my most anticipated list as well. And then for the rest, you know, there's a Civil War that's coming, but... Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. It's not going the mostly, like, uh, complete Marvel fanboy route, and the fact that I can't see it until January, probably The Revenant, which is the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and... Oh, where he got, like... Um, friggin frostbite and he almost died while yeah. making it it looks so amazing I just want to see that shit just like give that man an Oscar already it does seem like this is going to be the one like right now it all seems to be going in his favor so this might finally, this might finally be the year where the Leonardo DiCaprio memes might be over and may they rest in hell you know, because right now I can say that I have just as many Oscars as Leonardo DiCaprio, and yeah. I wouldn't be wrong. It does seem very shocking that the fa- that the man hasn't won one yet. Like you'd expect him to have like three Oscars, considering the amount of roles and amount of critically acclaimed roles he's done. Yeah, and then he lost to so many people, like so many good people as well. So then you can't really blame him. Like I'm just trying to think of the people that he lost to. But, uh, and for Django, he didn't even get nominated. Yeah, that's kind of lame. Well, he lost to Christoph Waltz in that movie. But, you know, Giver, who was also pretty great. But, uh, I think that is the end of this, uh, podcast. This is the, I think, probably the second to last episode of, uh, next year, of uh, this year, of 2015. Yeah. Yeah, we've got one more podcast coming probably next week. And then we go on holiday break. Yes. I actually am on our holiday break already. Well, I'm looking for some internship stuff now. Well, I'm going to be on vacation as of two days from now. But I'm officially going on vacation for, like, with the family and stuff. Ah, cool. Uh, from like Christmas to a little bit after New Year's. Right. But uh, anyway, I think that is about it. You can find me on uh, on Twitter at the Matt Hero, and also of course on G1 Features, where we do all the content stuff. So please go and subscribe to that and what and watch what we do there. We recently revived the G1 Best Ever. This time, G1 Worst Ever. The Worst video game movies. It's quite a treat. It's created by Asai Nero Tran. Go check that out. Oh, yeah. I like him. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, we got the last Groovies of 2015 coming up. We got a new G1 interviews, hopefully coming up soon. That's been on a bit of a hiatus because Tom the Iron Man has been super busy. And there's, like, he's been on a really cool project, uh, big G1 interviews, which will be revealed more soon. And then, uh, yeah, go uh, do all that stuff. And where can I find you? You can find me on Twitter at Gear12 underscore Turbo. All right. Well, then, I guess uh, this is it. And uh, have a wonderful day. Have a nice holiday if you're going. And, uh, yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye.